All right. That was about a minute, I think. Um, I would like to thank everybody for coming to uh, the Science of APIs in a Mobile World, Security, Control, and Quality. Today, the um, slides will be shared on SlideShare, and you'll get a recording and the SlideShare link a few days from now. If you have any questions, um, enter them into the, um, the, the chat box, QA box, and we'll take those at the end of the call. And to get started, I'm Laura Heritage. I'm the Director of API Strategy at SOA Software. Uh, with me, I have John Musser, who is the CEO of API Science, and all of you know him from Programmable Web. John, do you want to say hi? Good morning. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Good to be here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Folks. Thanks for having us. All right. Okay. So to uh, to get started, um, if, if, if you're all good, uh, stay tuned, and we will have a demo in the second half of the the, the presentation. So um, that will be really exciting. All right. So let's continue. Um, 50 billion connected devices by 2020. Pretty amazing stuff. What's even more amazing is the amount, number of apps and APIs that are going to be powering those app experiences, the consumer experiences by 2020, the, it, that the number of experiences will just explode, the number of APIs are exploding. As an enterprise, this is, this is affecting you tremendously today, and it's only going to continue to get, um, I, I want to say worse or better, uh, but it, it's just going to continue on this trajectory. APIs are going to power the di digital world from both the strategic business um, objectives and operational objectives. You as enterprises are going to start using more and more third-party APIs to run core business processes. In that same vein, you're going to be producing more and more APIs internally to run those core business processes and then taking them outside the enterprise as well, opening, completely opening your enterprise up, completely changing your consumer experiences. And it doesn't even matter who those consumers are, who if you're not like a truly consumer-facing customer or if it's a partner-facing um, type uh, uh, company. Um, the API is going to represent the experience of, of your company. Um, so enterprises um, aren't going to be able to live in self-contained ecosystems anymore, right, because of this explosion. Um, and you have to be a digital enterprise to succeed. And that means opening up. So what do you do? Um, with Because this is such a tremendous experience and, and your company's external persona, you really have to be concerned about security, control, and the quality of your API. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because what happens when a mobile app accessing your data is compromised? How do you, how do you revoke that, that, uh, that app access to that data, right? How can you securely um, open your APIs up to the developer community? So to begin with, you have to look and see, well, what does end-to-end -end security really mean? I mean, what do you really need to secure? One, you have to manage the user experience, right? Because if your, your consumers don't like your user experience, even though you've got the most secure, you know, API mobile app, if the experience is bad, nobody's going to use it, right? So it's really managing that that uh, user experience with the balance of of very secure apps and APIs and securing that channel and securing the back end infrastructure. So what are the the basically six you know high level security bits in that end to end uh, security for an application? Do you have to really focus on one is the authentication and authorization of the end user. Okay, the second is the authenticate, well, the, the entitlement of the app or the developers that are using your API um, to build the app, okay? How do you validate that with, with app keys, app IDs, secrets, and so forth? The next is once those two things are occur, how do you securely um, handle the message flowing back and forth between the app from the app end and the back end system? How do you pr protect against threats? Right? I mean, do you have to look, you have to look for the, the, uh, 
SQL injections, all, all of that denial of service, all of those type of threats. I mean, the threat list is a, is a mile long. Finally, you have to do some content filtering, like making sure that the, the, uh, the content that the end user and the app is getting is, is relevant to them, right? They're supposed to be dealing with that, you know, worrying about PCI, all that kind of stuff. Finally, you've got rate limiting. How do you control and, and, and throttle and rate limit the app usage, okay? Now, you got to remember, look right here on the screen, we're, we're thinking, talking in terms of one app, but you could have hundreds of thousands of apps um, using your API at this time. This stuff is not easy, okay? I've had several customers, you know, that they wonder if they should roll their own, implement their own API management system, implement their own API gateway, or if they should, uh, if they should purchase uh, an API management vendor out there. Okay, um, it's difficult. The companies out there that that started building this stuff before there were API management co companies that that really focused hard on this are now looking to purchase um, a, an API management system because it is tough, and that's not their business. Their business is something else. They're not in the business of maintaining the platform. I mean, you have to be really detailed and, and know your security if you're going to take this on yourself. And, and there's a lot of things to do. So people rely, should rely on an API management system that has a, a, a secure API gateway to protect, that handles the security, the authentication, the protection, the integration with your identity management, um, you know, the encryption, and all of that quality of service stuff. And, and focus on your real business and give yourself a uh, assurance that your APIs are are really being secure and protected. So now let's say let's say we've got our API securely controlled and 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 managed so we can you know authenticate, authorize, protect against threats, we can validate the apps if an app you know is, is compromised, we can revoke the access, all that kind of great stuff. But how do you ensure 90% uptime or 99.9% .9 uptime, how would you become proactive uh, with your operation, right? How do you identify bottlenecks? How do you protect, you know, prevent security breaches? Well, analytics helps you do that, right? Having that monitoring view about what's going on with your API in your enterprise. And when you talk about analytics, kind of an overloaded term, there's three forms of analytics that I'm going to introduce today. The business analytics. This is how you track product and customer experience. You know, you, you um, identify new trends and opportunities and so forth from a business perspective. And you can get that great information out of your APIs as well, okay, um, by analyzing the data and the traffic going back and forth. Uh, the next aspect of analytics is the operational analytics, ensuring you have operational excellence in your enterprise. Ensure, you know, you can analyze the error code and response code, um, spot trends of, of when when you have, uh, you know, slow response time or when you're more likely to see some issues and so forth. And third is the API analytics, being able to really take a look at, okay, what are the top um, APIs, uh, analyze the APIs by licenses in order to do monetization and, and so forth. Today, what we're going to focus on as far as quality is the, the operational analytics and the API analytics. Okay, so SOA software provides a digital platform. We provide an API management platform for you to manage your APIs. We provide your security platform, so we take care of that really tough stuff for you to ensure quality and control. We provide cloud integration for you, and we also provide analytics so that you can, you know, get that business operational and API analytics all rolled, all, all rolled into one in one single platform. So let's take a look at, um, from monitoring and auditing perspective, what API, uh, it, so software's API management solution provides is some real-time monitoring. And we're going to see this in the demo. So you can see real-time what is going on um, with the APIs, how many um how much throughput are you getting per second, per minute? Um, what's the average response time if there's any errors and so forth? So you can get some real good detailed data. We can then even go further and inspect individual calls and see, well, why did this, 
this one, you know, like in the picture here, why did this one take uh, a second longer than all the other transactions? You can go in and see what data was passed and so forth. Finally, we do a uh, uh, user um, SLA quota, so all sorts of usage quotas, um, and you can specify those with policies and and so forth. And we'll take a look look at that in a in a few minutes. And finally, you have the average response time for apps and so forth. So you can really segment and and, and see the operationally what's going on um, with your APIs and with the apps using those APIs. All of the SLA monitoring, alerting, and enforcement capabilities are done via policy. So you can create some really robust policies and attach them to operations, resources, and so forth of, of your APIs and, and begin monitoring those. This is from all from a full software perspective. So what I uh, – the, the type of monitoring you get from an API management platform or a digital platform like SOA software is what I call um, – Provider monitoring. So while so a software, we provide a view of the, the analytics monitoring data to the consumer so they can see, um, you know, their usage and so forth. Um, and we have a view of the analytics and the monitoring from an operational and API, per, uh, API perspective. That's all from the provider experience, okay? And depending on who your consumer is, they can have a different experience. So, for example, if your uh, consumer is in Vancouver, they might have a different experience than someone is in New York. The guy in New York might be experiencing out an outage or a really bad latency problem, but you, from your provider experience, say, well, everything's fine on my end. So how do you... How do you problem determine? How do you resolve that issue? How do you make it out of he said, she said type of engagement? And that's where um, API science comes in. They provide what I call external monitoring. They give me that um, – sorry, I'm going to go to the next page. They give me that true consumer experience from various locations around the world, and I can marry my that true experience from what – the consumers are experiencing from what my API monitoring does from my enterprise experience and put those two together to, to actually realize what's going on with my API and ensure that, you know, I, I have a good quality API. Um, another thing that API science allows you to do is that I find uh, valuable for our customers is to simulate multi-step developer actions, such as CRUD, so that it, it gives you not just a, can I hit this endpoint, ping this endpoint type monitoring. It, it really simulates what a developer will do and if a step will fail within that the developer experience. So it really helps you pinpoint and solve problems before they begin. And what we've done from um, so a software perspective, we've come out with a tech preview that integrates API science monitoring data back into um, so a software's developer portal dashboard so you have an integrated view of what your provider monitoring and analytics says and what API science is saying your consumers are experiencing from various locations around the world. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to John, um, and he is going to explain a little bit more. Great. Thank you, Laura. That's a wonderful intro. And I think, you know, that's, that's a great segue, right? Because it's the, the SOA software side, the API management side, the provider side, you get, you get a view into what's going on behind the firewall in a very detailed level. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you know what's going on around the world, developers consuming your API, whether that's your own app consuming your API, whether it's partners or third party developers, any of them, you want to know What's going on with them? So that's what, that's what any, any kind of type, that's what we provide, right? So you're interested in these attributes, or right? you want to know the performance. Is it, is it slow? Is it, is it, is there a huge latency somewhere? Is it up? Does the availability be? You want to be alerted, right? So if any of these things don't work, I want to know. Let my operations team know there's an issue. And then longer term, you want to know from an external perspective with my API, what are the trends? So that I, is it getting slower? Is it getting faster? Did that deployment I made last week, did that have an impact? I want to know those things. I want to know them both internally and externally. 
So diving in a bit here, uh, when you think about it, uh, why would you want to do this? Right? What can go wrong? And again, what can go wrong, particularly outside? Um, you know, what is that developer experience? What is that API consumer experience really like? Um, and sometimes that's hard to see, particularly on the on the provider side, because there's so much noise. Even if you're logging everything, it can be hard to see the, the from the trees. So here, here's a few examples, right? Now, connectivity errors, data integrity errors. Is it, is it slow? Uh, do, can I validate my JSON or XML response? Maybe maybe that's not right. Uh, maybe I think I'm returning something. Everything seems green on the inside, but it turns out that actually some of that data is well I thought it was, and I'll show you a couple of examples of, of what that what we've seen where folks have got data that just didn't look quite right. Uh, content issues and the case errors. So there's a variety of things to watch out for, right? And I think just to take a step historically back, some of you who've been around know that well, wait, I you know I've had websites. You know, again APIs are an evolution, an evolution of, of what's going on on the internet. It's a much more connected world. But historically when you think about monitoring um, on the operation side, typically you would have a website and you'd have a web server, and then you'd set up a monitor on that. So some, this is a business that's been around for 20 years, website monitoring business. Either you roll your own or you use a third party, SaaS service, and you, you watch the web server. Let my team know if my web server is down because I want to know right now. Now, if you have a shopping cart, an e-commerce website, you're going to want to set up a set of monitors, or for most websites, you really want to have a set of monitors to watch transactions to make sure that my, my shopping cart is actually working because otherwise my e-commerce site is in big trouble. Now today the picture looks a bit different. It's a bit more complicated, right? We have this world of mobile apps, websites, third-party apps. We're using my web server. We're using third-party APIs. We're using my own API. So it becomes this tangled, interconnected web of integration for almost every app, right? It's these days, almost every app you build has some level. It's, it's, it's a integrated tub of goo to some extent. So now I can monitor all these things, right? Because I think what, what we found is, and what, what any of you who are running these operations have seen, is that any one of these parts can break. And if any one of these parts break, it means that my app might not be working, my website might not be working, my partners might be calling me on the phone to complain because it turns out that my infrastructure isn't providing what they what we promised. So I think that's a bit of a historical context. If you look at it here, I just want to sort of draw a summary of sort of the path of what monitoring historically has been and the way in which it's evolving. And this is sort of where API science and where we helping folks with the more modern pain points against the traditional. So step one there is, you know, in the past we would monitor web transactions, but today it's API transactions. Similar but different. The old days you would log, test your web login into that work, but today I have this thing called OAuth. I need to make sure that my OAuth transactions are working because that's critical to my API. And it's not simple as any, anyone who's used OAuth certainly knows. In the old days you might have monitored, uh, the third one there is monitor, you know, is there a string in my website? But today you can actually monitor XML and JSON, much more sophisticated monitor. Um, uh, monitor my own website, so now I need to monitor my stuff, plus I need to monitor all the things that I depend on. Um, now I need to monitor, I used to just have to monitor my own website, but now I have to monitor my own website plus the other things that I rely on. And at the bottom there, that last one, in, in the web, in the website monitoring world, there's this trend that these days called real user monitoring. What's that user experience who's hitting my website? And what's that really feel like from around the world? And I think what we need here and what folks are seeing is I need real developer monitoring. I need to know what my developers, my API consumers are really experiencing out there consuming my, living off of my platform. And so I think there's really four, leaves us with four fundamentals, right? You boil it down. There's availability monitor. Is my API up or down? The second is performance monitoring. Is it slow? Is it fast? Is it slow? Again, how is it doing versus what it used to do? What's my standard deviation? The third is content. And again, it's not simple content of, does that kind of match the string? It's I expect this API call to return 12 rows of JSON data, and if it doesn't, I want to know about it before my customers did. And the fourth core fundamental to monitoring an API is transactions, because so often an API isn't just I'm going to ping or get this API call, get a response. I need to actually do a series of actions. I need to 
log in, I need to get a token, and I need to use that token to perform other actions on my API and make sure that those are working, right? Because I secured it, as Laura talked about. I secured my API. But that often will tie into a set of transactions that I need in order to effectively monitor that end consumer experience. So talking about finding issues before your customer do, I want to just give you a couple of real-world examples that we've seen. So, and the names have been changed here to protect the innocent, but uh, these are real responses. So here was an API call asking for some XML and uh, for a product, and what came back in response was a error message, with, which was completely unhelpful. Um, and that so happens the provider in this case wasn't aware that this was going on. Um, because it was returning responses, it just wasn't returning what they thought. So the consumer did. But but frankly, that's better than this response, which again is a real world response. Uh, names would change. But this API call asked for uh, JSON product description, and what they got back was a web logic stack trace. And trust me, you do not want to be returning a web logic stack trace instead of the JSON that the developer asked for. Right? That's not a good thing. So by applying effective external API monitoring, you can get a heads up when any of these types of issues arise and address them before they escalate. Uh, a couple more examples. Here's one where you don't want to be the, the API that this guy is talking about in the Twitter spread where he says, yeah, I had to I had to call to let the other API was down. You, you don't want to be that API, right? So, and I think... That represents that view of your API. Right? You can monitor that and make sure that that's not you. The other flip side of that is here's an example where a provider was apologizing to their customers because a third-party API that they relied on was down or changed. Uh, so here they said it's down, sorry, we're working against ReConnect and coming back to right? not the place that you would be feeling comfortable. So you often will want to monitor the things that you rely on. Uh, how are they performing now? How are they performing over time? How are they getting better or worse? So you can use API science to keep track of those. And here's a, a list of, you know, part of what we do is we, again, take it beyond what you could have done with historical website monitoring or many of the traditional tools. So uh, API science is a SaaS-based DevOps tool running in the cloud around the world where you set up monitors against your APIs, and you can do uptime monitoring, performance monitoring. The things we've talked about get alerts. Uh, you can do set up scripts, and we'll give you some examples of that. Uh, we have team addition. We have an API. So the API of our API of our platform allows and facilitates. Right? We live in an API-centric world that facilitates this integration between. That we're talking about here. We're going to demonstrate between SOA software and API science, where SOA software is using our APIs to pull the monitoring data back directly into that console. Um, and I think when you sort of go through this combination, here's what you get, right? You get this end of what Laura was talking about, that, that quality from end to end, that visibility all the way through the pipeline of what the developer is consuming all the way back behind your firewall, all the way down to your database. That combines that API consumer plus the provider analytics, right? So you get that benefit of having those two together which in turn gives you that third item, that global picture of how is my API performing around the world? What does that holistic view look like? And again, now last but not least, is I'm going to find the problem before my API consumers do, whether that API consumer is my own app or whether that's a partner or a third-party developer. I think with that, we'll, I'll hand it back to Laura, and then we'll run through a demo to let you see what this all looks like in practice. All right. Thank you. All right, let's see. Sorry. It is, I'm in Chicago today, and it's absolutely freezing here. I'm not ready for winter, let me tell you. Okay, let me share my desktop. <laughs> Put my coat on. Sorry if I rustled, rustled the, the mic there for a minute. I forgot I wasn't on mute. Okay, so here we are. Um, what we're looking at here is is I'm logged in as an API administrator into um, Scylla Software's developer portal. Which is called Community Manager, and I, I have a we have the Pets API. Um, it's it's the we're, we're borrowed Swagger's Pets API, and we basically proxied that API, added some security around it, and um, some 
some quota management and, and things like that. And, and you can see, uh, we, it's actually, it's called, we call it licensing. So you can create a licensed product. Um, so you can say a certain quality is the traditional gold, bronze, silver one, or free, premium, and, and platinum packages with, uh, um, you know, different throughput, different, uh, usage, um, constraints that you want to put on the API. All right. So let's, let's go, let's dig into the monitoring. Um, first when we log in for monitoring, this is real time monitoring. This is what I have done, uh, a script running and sending um, traffic through the the API management system, and it's, it's right now I can see um, I can select which environment I want to um, view the monitoring of. Right now I only have a sandbox environment, but um, if I have my production environment, I I drop down and be able to look at the difference between between environments, production, and um, and my sandbox. Uh, I can see what. Uh, what performance looks like from a, a second or minute view. Uh, right now it's on second, so I change this to the minute view. Um, I get the throughput of 55 per minute right now, and an average latency is about 227 milliseconds. I can also see things by, um, you know, by the app, which apps are sending the, the most traffic in, um, usage by operations that are occurring, and the top performing APIs as a whole in my system. And I can export all of this information. I can see top contributors as well. Um, another option uh, feature is, you know, you can have several different versions of the API running at the same time. And so we have the option of flipping between the different versions and viewing the, the, uh, the monitoring capabilities. Next, we'll take a look at the, the chart. And this just gives you a quick view of the the average, um, the average min and max and average time for calls to take, and you can um, change the um, change the time, spread it out so you can more easily see um, in certain areas. I had a fault this morning um, that I had to look at, and one you know for a while this morning it was taking like two two seconds, which was really odd. But as you can see, things normalized. Sometimes during the day, it got uh, it. it got a little slower and so forth, so you kind of wonder what's going on. Um, you can view this um, this type of, uh, again, you can switch to different uh, the environments. I can switch between um, different apps and just zone in on, like, let's say a customer that is using the um, API out in Vancouver is, is having issues. So I can drill down and look at their specific issues and, and what they, you know, what they want to do. Um, but I can't. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this gives me the provider view of the mon monitoring. I can change the times, and I can print and, and recycle, refresh the logs. I can then drill down into um, individual logs, like this one right here. Why is why is this taking 300 milliseconds? It's kind of an anomaly because on average it's been around 134. You can see what you're seeing here is like this, the total amount of time to get the uh, request back to the, the end user was 328 milliseconds. So what we can do is we can expect, inspect the incoming um, request. This was a get, so the body was empty. Um, you can see the headers. Um, it came from, because it was from my curl, uh, came from a, a curl agent, and then I can see some additional information that's pertinent to the request coming in. And you can see the request going into the, the back end. Now, this, this represents, this is coming into the API gateway, and this represents going to the back end, the time it took to go to the back end service and then come back. It was 328 uh, milliseconds. And by the time it came back, um, 326, and then it's 328 um, all the way out to the front. But you can see, you know, if I needed to, I could re uh, inspect the body to see, well, is there something in here that caused the that caused the delay? Again, I can filter by environment, by day. I can you know really dig in and find the, the particular logs that I want, and, and how much you log can be configured in in the policy as well. You know, obviously because of PCI and, and so forth. Um, licensing this this shows per um, the app what they are licensed to use. For example, this test app that I have is exceeding its usage count, which is okay. I did not have a policy to 
stop their access because I want over, overage charges. Um, so that's fine if they go over for me and they should just up their, um, you know, kind of like how uh, sex plans, uh, texting plans used to be. They don't mind if you go over because they get to charge you more. But anyway, that's a that's a whole other topic of conversation. But you can see, um, uh, I can see all of the different apps. I can focus in on one particular app's um, usage charge. This is for today. Um, they're also going over. Uh, I can uh, change uh, to a week view, so I can see how they're doing for a week. And uh, you know, this is that they've been exceeding their overages a lot. Um, but anyway, you can see uh, different usage counts. You can also go down and, and for a month. And the neat thing about this is you can see it for a month. Okay, here's their usage count. Um, they've had 20,000 uh, requests this month. They have average response time of uh, over 750 milliseconds. Um, this was for the API as a whole. The response uh, message size total response message size that they have, they've got over um, seven megs. So you can drill down and, and look at that. Again, all of this, I'm not going to go in today on how to configure some of the policies around that, because uh, I really want to get to this next section. But you can get really creative on the different types of policies around licensing and SLA management and alerting and, and all that kind of, kind of good stuff. The interesting thing, everything I showed you now, that was all from the provider view. Everything that we see, everything that goes through the gateway, and we can get to the back end and see what's going on there and so forth. So for my view, everything looks fine. And, and I'm going to go back here and grit, verify, you know, like these calls are um, the, the fine by, by status. You know, it's, it's, it's averaging around 132, 144, 124, 150. So around there, milliseconds. Now let's go to the external view. So what I've done is I've defined uh, several monitors in API science. And then what I did is I registered those monitors within um, SOA software's API management um, API science widget. Okay, and that stores those monitors. And then what I did using um, API science's APIs, which they're, they're easy and nice to use, just like John always preaches to us, um, so he's practicing what he preaches. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I was easily able to grab, go over, hook up, grab their data, bring it in, and create this, um, uh, create the, so I can get a quick view within my, um, API management system from the provider view of monitoring to the external view, consumer view of monitoring, how the, the performance is and the uptime and, and so forth based on, you know, those geographical locations. So let's see, find pet by status. Let's look at that one. So this one, the John's monitors, well, mine was, we, the ones that we just looked at were about 100, and they range from 130 milliseconds to 150 um, some milliseconds. That was from my view, right? Um, from, from John's consumer view, it's about 170 milliseconds. Okay, and it's had 100% uptime, and and you can see you can you can get that that perspective of what your consumers are really experiencing. Okay, um, the other thing, so I, I'm going to add. I can easily add uh, another. I have another monitor um, that I've registered, and so I'm going to add that to my group um, using John's APIs. Again, this is a tech preview. But using John's APIs, I could uh, really ought take the time and automate pulling over all of this, um, all of the monitor information, so I can easily associate the APIs with the the API monitors with the APIs that I have in in um, so a software solution. I just uh, added the monitor and it's, it's uh, monitor 427 find by order ID, and you can see it had some issues on um, is that Monday. Yeah, it must have been Monday. I don't know what day. The 25th. No, that was Saturday. That was Saturday um, and Sunday. So you, you can see some, you know, some really good good information here. I can also, um, if I need to go and change a monitor or, um, you know, see more detailed monitoring information, information that I didn't bring over into um, SOA software, 
I can just click on um, the link and it'll bring me over into uh, into API Science and then I can play with my monitors there. And now I'm going to pass it over to John and he's going to go into a lot more detail about all the, the, the great um, capabilities of API Science. All right, so I need to stop sharing. And now you're the presenter. All right, the big, the big handoff here. So let me share. Thanks, Laura. That was a great sort of segue here. Let me uh, bring you over to that same monitor. Um, are we there? Does that look? See that, Laura? Yeah. Yes. I we hit dog. Excellent. All right. So here I am, and I've now. So a couple of things. So I'm now picked up exactly where Laura had left off. And as a, as, a, as a FYI, I'm actually on her team. So this is Heritage & Co., Heritage Co. So I'm another, we're using the team edition of API Science. So John? Uh, we're sh hey, John, just one second. Do you think you can move your the, the app up and to the left of your screen a little bit? There ah, we okay. go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I didn't know the, uh, there we go. Better? Yeah, oh, that right. was good. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. All right, so, uh, the, uh, so, so here I am, I'm, I'm back in that same monitor, and so when I look at that monitor, I see that the, the pet store API, so look at the top here, it's called Get Dog, right? It's active, I'm doing a get call, and what we can see here is the API endpoint that we were that Laura had set up against that, that pet store swagger API. And here's Washington, D.C. So we're, here's where we're monitoring it from. So we, she's chosen to set it up from Washington, D.C. at a relatively slow frequency. And you can, on production, you'd want to be monitoring this every minute or so. Um, here's a much more detailed chart of that same API. So Again, I can get a more detailed breakdown of the various components of how long did it take to resolve, transfer, and process that request. Um, if I scroll down the same page, here I see the history of the most recent request. Um, and I can see that this is being called from where, how long did it take. And I scroll down a little bit further, I can see the another detail that isn't in what Laura has shown you earlier, which is the uptime history. So I can see over the last, looks like about a week or so, when this API was up or when it was reporting errors and when it wasn't. Um, you can see a couple of downtimes here. Actually, one from yesterday was down for less than a minute. And just to sort of round out this page, you can see that we have alert rules for um, what I can do is I can say, if these are the criteria by which if a validation fails or if any call fails, I can pop this up and say, if any call fails, notify, for example, me or I can add other contacts and define, based upon the validation rules I set up, what sort of alerts should be sent when. So if I scroll back up, I can, for example, show you the most recent check that was run. So I clicked on that link, and I said, here is a call summary. Again, it was simulating the developer hitting your API from, in this case, Washington, D.C. So it was performed, this one, uh, 41 minutes ago. Um, and... I can see how long it took. I can see the total time. I can see the total size. I can see that it passed all the validations. And then if I scroll down, I can see, oh, here's the body. This is what was returned with that API call. I can see the headers, all the usual stuff that you expect from an API. Now, if I go back, I say, often you'll, of course, want to know green is fine. I actually want to know when things don't work. So if I click down here on one of the failures, um, I can see that this returned a 5 Three, which caused this to uh, say this service is not available. So that was the get call, right? And if I go back to the dashboard, let me bring it back all the way here. Here I am back at the top level. So this is what you would normally see when you log into API Science and you set up a set of monitors from around the world to watch various API endpoints. So at the top, I can see how many do I have to find. And as I scroll down, I can see our joint set of monitors. So there's four on the left here that are around the pet store demos. And then there's half a dozen. The last two are what we call public or really 
example sample APIs. I want the JavaScript to sample and a multi-step example. I'll get into those in a second to show you what they are. But those are shared to help users get a jump start on, on how API science works. So we just looked at get dog. Let me show you really quickly how we would add a monitor. So I click on the add a monitor button. And part of our goal is it should take you less than a minute to set up a simple monitor. You know, there shouldn't be much to it. So here, I say it's what you call a monitor. I put in a URL. And I pick which HTTP method I want to monitor or want to call. And I could set up parameters, headers, validation. Um, validations are a bit interesting here. So I could check on response code, fairly straightforward. I could check on the regular expression. So I can do a simple string, complex string. I can validate whether in this particular case it's valid JSON. Or I could also validate, run an entire JavaScript script uh, at the end of each call to, to say, does this, and I'll give you an example of a more sophisticated JavaScript script. Um, and this script here is another type of scripting which allows you to do multi-step, and I'll give you an example of that. So here, let's go in and I'll click this Test Now button, and I put in the URL. All I really said so far was URL and get, and often you'll need to just tweak these to make sure you set up the right parameters, so I said Test Now, right on the same page, it gives me back, but great, I got back a body of lions. So pet number seven is a, just a lion. So that looks good. So I will give this a name, and I'll call it get lion, get lion. And I'll run this every 10 minutes, and I'll run it from, in this case, we're just set up for a few locations. I'll say Ireland, and I'll save that monitor. So I'm done. Uh, I now brought back to the profile page for that monitor, and I can see the lions, and here, and it gave me that first response. And I can scroll down and see 100% uptime because I have just set this monitor up. So again, I think that's to go back to the dashboard, you can see just how easy it should be to set up a monitor. So now it says I have seven monitors. The most recent one, less than a minute ago, was Get Lion. See at the top there. So a couple other quick things to show you here. First of all, the example of running a JavaScript validation. So that theme that APIs are different than website monitoring. Um, here I'm calling the uh, a get call on the Facebook graph API on the White House. And if I come in here and I say what I'd like to do is I want to show you, I want to show you the uh, JavaScript validation. And in that validation, there are a few things. First of all, you can see that we ask for the timing. So here, I'm saying that when this returns, get me the timing. How long does this call take? I'm also saying, this is, again, this is a straight JavaScript. Uh, you don't need to learn a new language. Uh, give it the size. And then I'm going to say, you know what, if it was more than five seconds, these are milliseconds, and the size was, I want to make sure that the size was less than 10K. If it was more than 10K, and it took more than five seconds, and it took less than five seconds, then I, uh, less than 10 days or more than five seconds, then there's an issue. So this assertion will trigger off a validation alert, and if I set up any alert rules, it'll notify my ops team who have ever been told that this is an issue. If I scroll down, I can see that there was a test on the header, right? So I can test anything in this response, this API call response. So I want to make sure that it has a prank that says no cache. And last but not least, I want to say, uh, in this case, I want to check something in the body, and I want to check the city name. In this case, I'm checking for a city that actually won't match because I'm going to say Armok, but that isn't where the White House is. And that would fail this assertion and it would throw off an alert. This gives you a lot of, a lot more power and flexibility than you get from a standard monitoring operation. So, and last thing I want to throw out here that a lot of our customers are using are the ability to run a multi-step transaction. Again, it's often not enough to make a single API call. So if I go to this multi-step example, here we are using the WordNIC API. So the WordNIC API, I'm going to run an entire CRUD sequence. I'm going to create, I'm going to update, I'm going to delete in real time in production. So this allows me to, so if I'm going to go scroll down here, see there's six steps. And I think the best way to quickly show you this is to go to one that was recently run, this was run, uh, 19 minutes ago, and here's the response from that test, from that monitor, and it called a get, 
in this get call passed an API key and a password, which have been filtered out because this is a shared monitor. And I got back a response. And here's the interesting part. So I got back a token, a user ID, and a signature. And I'm going to use those because I need those to do anything meaningful with this API. So if I go to what happened in step two, what I've done is I've set up a very simple script that said I'm going to parse this JSON. And I'm going to pull out the token from the body. So I pull out that token. And now I'm going to use that as a parameter, as an auth token parameter, so that I can then go and get back what I expected to get back. I did this get call, and I want to make sure that I got two words back from my dictionary. And sure enough, here are the two words. And, and again, I can set up one of those validation scripts to say whatever I want on this. But I can say that the array size of this JSON should be two. And then step three, I'm going to go in. I'm actually now going to do a post call. So you can see here it's doing a post method, and I'm going to pass in a body that says Python. So I'm going to add the word Python to my dictionary, and it returned a 200 response. Step four, I'm going to go in, and now naturally I'm going to want to make sure that that really, really works. So I'm going to do another get, and I'm going to say, get me my list of words, and I'm going to pass in those same parameters. And sure enough, if I look at the body, I got back three words. And those are the words that I wanted to see. That's great. I've passed it. And step five, I want to clean up after this because in production, I don't want to leave those hanging around. And so I do a delete word. And I'm going to pass in that word Python again. And I'm going to get back. In this case, the 200 means it worked. The body's empty. That's fine. And then step six, I'm going to go, go back. I'm going to do a get on the word. And I want to make sure that I'm back to two words. So I've got a full cycle. So I've got a full CRUD sequence. I got it. I added. I checked. I deleted it. And those are the type of transactions that I think our, our, our customers have found are much more meaningful and important in watching doing production level API monitoring. And with that, I think that wraps up the, the demo portion. Hold on a second here. And I will leave that. And are we, Laura, are you there? I I think so. Hello. There we go. I'll pass it back over. All um, right. All righty. So. Uh, now, um, if you have any questions, type uh, the questions into the Q&A section in your window, and we have uh, a few minutes that we can uh, ask, answer some questions. So we'll give it a minute. There is a question in the Q&A box that says, how are you different from other vendors? What is your key fame from mobile API perspective? OK. Um, all right. So is that directed to me or to John? <laughs> <laughs> How are <laughs> so? Do you want? Um, I can I can answer yeah. it, and why don't you answer it too, John? So from yeah. a software's perspective, why why we're um, unique than than under uh, other vendors? One um, is that we provide um, support for APIs from the full life cycle, from the the design time phase all the way up through to production, and we can put the uh, we can do life cycle management around those APIs. We also support um, uh, both SOAP and, and REST APIs, and we're the only vendor that has the true convergence of, of, of their SOA and API platform, so that you can leverage uh, a single platform and, and be able to run both your uh, SOA-based um, services, be it REST or, or SOAP, and uh, your, your APIs and, and manage, manage your APIs. And I can go on forever, ever, why we're unique, but I'll end there and pass it on to John right. to give a couple of com comments. Yes. And from our perspective, a couple of things. First of all, we're, we're API first, we're API centric, right? So everything we look about, look at from a, from a, from a mobile, from an API, from a platform perspective is, is about the API. So a number of those features that I just demonstrated, another one that we didn't get to, really center on what makes APIs different. Um, and simulating the experience of real developers, a real mobile app, real uh, uh, round the world global performance and availability 
that you, you can't get elsewhere. Um, and then secondly, we are, again, very API-centric as, as per this integration with, with SOA software that everything that you can do in the application, you should be able to do from our API. So integrating with all of the various DevOps tools and configuration scripts. And, what, and really, monitoring should be a first-class citizen. We, we've learned that uh, deploying, uh, deploying infrastructure should be like code now, right? Uh, infrastructure as a service, EC2, all these things. We just deploy these things. And so monitoring should really be treated similarly, right? So why, when I update my application and I push all that code out to production, well, I'd like to be able to actually push out an update to my monitors to make sure that my monitors are matching my current API. So to treat that all, again, as monitoring as code and configuration as code, this is another piece of that same puzzle as to where things are are moving. Great. So we have um, a number of other questions, and uh, I think if, if we don't get to all the questions, um, I believe Laura's going to try and answer them in a blog post subsequently. Um, but the question is, how does licensing work? Is it a hosted solution? Uh, well, certainly from the API science side, we are we are a hosted solution. Uh, we are a fast-paced solution. And it's licensed on a tiered pricing model based on consumption. So the, the more APIs that you set up, the more frequently you call, the pricing is tiered on that model. So it's, it's a cloud fast solution. Okay. I, I see another question. I see a question on um, the question is, uh, does API, uh, does SOA software support um, message translation with, with, I can't tell if that was be, supposed to be for API science or for SOA science, does it support message translation with XSLP? Um, so a software does, and also does message translation with uh, uh, JavaScript and, and Bean scripting and, and a couple other tools as well. Um, John, I don't know if that question is for you. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it was more of your question. For that yeah, but, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, let me see another one. Um, Can we, uh, there's a question here, can we differentiate between standard and premium clients to meet their SLA under SLM? Okay, can we differentiate between standard and premium clients? So you can set up um, different SLAs and uh, SLMs for uh, standard and premium clients, and when you look in the, the licensing view, you can see, and, and you can set alerts as well. So if you want to be alerted if a, a particular uh, segment or SLM is is not being met um, for a particular client segment, you you can do that as well. So let's say your standard clients and your premium clients, you can have different alerts um, come available. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have in the queue. There's another question about will we send the package we presented, and certainly, as Laura noted, we'll put the, the slides and, and this presentation online in a, in a few days. Um, the, another question we have is we are using Policy Manager 6.125. I'm wondering if there's any um, chance of integrating the monitoring tool to PM directly without major changes. Currently, we are using uh, SOAP uh, web services only. Um, the, the monitoring that I showed um, right now was with uh, uh, that the monitoring that came in, in there was with uh, uh, community manager and and policy manager. I was running policy manager um, seven point one four, I believe, um, right now. I'll have to get back to um, you with your question on if we can use what monitoring for. Uh, uh, six one five, and if you're so John, if you're so you, uh, if you're so based, API science is, is purely purely RESTful APIs, correct? Right, and you can at the moment we you can make that work, but we have some some things in development that'll be more soap centric and do some interesting things on the soap side as well. Okay.
All right. Um, we have a few. I think I think we are good. And uh, the ones the questions that we didn't get to, uh, we will uh, get back to you personally on those questions because uh, I believe we are out of time. All right. Thank you for thank you for coming. And again, the slides will be posted, and the webinar will be um, posted as well in a couple of days. Great. Yeah. Likewise. Thank Thanks you. everyone for coming. Hello?